How many of y'all believe that we serve the kind of God who does new things? If you believe we serve the kind of God that does new things, say amen. amen. And you know me, I, I, like, I like the amen thing. I'm bringing it back. It was something that was kind of my dad's church and my grandparents' church. They were big ameners. So when I say say amen, you don't have to say amen. You can just sit there quietly. But it, I like it. Like it, it just stirs on a sense of it's not just my story. It's our story. So I appreciate those of you that believe that God does new things. How about this? How about if you believe that God does new things and you have confidence that he's a good God, how many of you believe that those new things are guaranteed to be better things? Yeah, it's true. Because our God doesn't go backwards. He doesn't retract. He, he doesn't start with beauty and deliver ashes. No, he takes the ashes and the pieces of our life and somehow figures out how to make beautiful things out of them. So our God, who is so good, he does new things. We know that his word says, don't you see it? Our God is doing a new thing. So we believe that. And if it's going to be a new thing, we can trust that it's going to be a better thing. And the word better is actually kind of the reason that we've been camped out in Hebrews over the last, really the last, you know, probably it'll be a total of about three and a half months. Because even our, our stories series, Ordinary People, Extraordinary God, was kind of loosely attached to Hebrews chapter 11. That's where Ed and I kind of bookended that series. And then we started the series in chapter 12 at the beginning of this month. We're spending the last four weeks in this, at, at this location in Hebrews chapter 12. And then next week at Valley High School, same series. We're just going to finish up the book of Hebrews and start in chapter 13. And the reason that Hebrews is a place that we went to is not, Ed and I don't just like put up, put up a dartboard and just throw and we just see where it lands, we preach that part of the Bible. No, we, 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 we consider, God, what are you doing in our church? And this is, you, you can study this for yourself, but so just trust me on it for today until you go and study it. But I could, I could boil down the theme of the book of Hebrews into one word, better. Really, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is reminding the church to hold on because there is something better. Keep going. Don't stop. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed by the persecution. I know you thought it would be different, but keep going because Jesus is better. And I'll skip it in my notes for the sake of time, but I have, I have just point after point after point through the book of Hebrews that just reminds us how that Jesus is better than the teachings that they had. The old covenant has been replaced with a new covenant. Jesus is superior. And here's the thing. That's why following Jesus makes like what we do so important. Converge, if, if I could figure out how to like inject us with, with this sense of passion and commitment to the mission and vision that we have the greatest news of all time, and his name is Jesus. And thank you, thank you, Steve. I really thought that'd be an amen section, but it's, we're, it's young and it, we're, we're just getting started here, so I'll give you some time to get warmed up. But next time I say something like that, it, it should be like, whoa! Amen! <laughs> Because that's good. That's good truth. But the truth of the matter is that I'm going to turn on the TV today. I'm so thankful, man. I'm so thankful I don't have cable or satellite TV anymore because every 15 minutes, especially in this season, an interruption to what I'm watching is going to be to tell me what issue I should vote for. And then two commercials later, it'll be the opposite side of the issue saying that's the most important issue to vote for. Like every 15 minutes is going to be what the most important message is, who the most important person is, and just fighting over who has the most important voice in our culture. Well, friend, you could stack up every single commercial and every single person that those commercials represent, every single issue on the planet, and it would pale in comparison to the greatest message of all time, and that is there is one whose name is Jesus who has come to change everything for us and to make our lives better and to make us better at living life. Amen. That's what he's come to do. And so we carry with us like the importance of that message. That's what a beautiful thing, what a beautiful invitation for it to be the church. Have you ever considered, like, have you ever wanted to say this, like, like God, what, what were you thinking? Not in a disrespectful way, but like, you you gave that message to us? I know me. And God said, yeah, I gave it to you. And I asked you to, to carry and to share the most important message that's ever been given. And Hebrews is 
reminding the people that he's writing to, the writer of Hebrews is saying, remember the thing that I've talked about because Jesus is better, better than what you see, better than what's right now. Just continue to hold on, continue to press forward. The book of Hebrews, you can boil it down, and it's really about just reminding the people that there is something better. Ed talked about some betters last week. I won't re-preach it, but I will just reach back to it. Hebrews chapter 12, I want to read the three verses that Ed read out of the message, beginning in verse 14. Work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise, you'll never get so much as a glimpse of God. When he put that on the screen, it was one of those verses that I know I've read, but I just was like, I saw it differently. I mean, that, what a scary verse that that is. Work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise, you'll never even get so much as a glimpse of God. Some of y'all should be panicked right now because of the way you treat people. Make sure no one gets left out of God's generosity. to Keep a sharp eye out for weeds of bitter discontent. A thistle or two gone to seed can ruin a whole garden in no time. Listen to this. This is cool. Watch out for Esau syndrome. Esau syndrome. I love the way the message says that. It's trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. You well know how Esau later regretted that impulsive act and wanted God's blessing, but by then it was too late, tears or no tears. The reason I want to reach back is because the heading over what, what Ed read last week and what I'm going to get into, it's the same heading. It's the same, if, if you want to know like a, like a, a Bible study theology word, it's the, the, those, are, those are pericopes. So you, you, it's a section. It's there. Ed's like, amen. He, had, he paid a lot of money for seminary to get that. I just learned it from him. Uh, but, but, so, so it's a pericope. So if you want to you you uh, like, like, like make your friends really proud of you, just be like, so which pericope are we currently in? They'll be like, what, what does that even mean? So it's the sections that have little headings. And th- this, this section with the heading is the same for Ed, what he preached in my Bible. could be different in yours. But in my Bible, it's the same heading for both what Ed preached and what I'm about to preach. And that heading is a call to listen to God. Important section. Important section. Which is why the writer begins to give some prerequisites. You want to be connected to God. You want to see God. You want to hear from God. How you treat people matters. There are some betters here. There's two of them I want to draw from real quick. First, the writer says there's a direct connection between our relationship with God and our relationship with people. Here's another way to say it. I see you hustling. I see you grinding. I see you trying to please God. I see you trying to do all you can do. You're killing yourself trying to make him proud, but you could miss him altogether. Man, there's a better way to please God, and that's to love his people. That's the first thing. There's There's a better way than just hustling and grinding. And then there's a second thing. The writer mentions Esau. Esau is a guy who traded his birthright for a cup of soup. That better be some good soup. And it's lentil soup. I don't know if I, you know, maybe some jambalaya perhaps, but I don't know about lentil soup. Here's what happened. He said, this is another way to say it. Be careful not to settle for something trivial and temporary because there's a better way. Esau traded something right now for something that would have been his identity later. There's an eternal blessing waiting. Esau syndrome says, don't worry about that. Get what you want right now because that's the most important thing. Friend, we have to be careful about Esau syndrome or else our ability to see and hear from God is at stake. Those four short verses that are part of this call to action, a call to listen to God, to hear from God. And then all of a sudden we pivot to the verses that I want to preach from. And without that context, it starts out kind of weird. Let's read verse 18. All of a sudden it says, this is the very next verse. You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness and gloom and whirlwind as the Israelites did in Mount Sinai. You're like, what? We were just talking about getting along with people. No, we're talking about listening and hearing from God, being connected to God. Verse 19, for they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. Here was God's command. If an animal even touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. We're going to read from the passage of Scripture in Exodus 19 that the writer in Hebrews is actually referencing But it's not just animals. If a person crossed this boundary and border, they were to be stoned or shot with arrows as well. Verse 21, this is the most most alarming part for me. The guy in charge, 
the guy who actually would go face to face with God and hear the voice of God, Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. This is happening at Mount Sinai. Well, like I mentioned, we're going to talk about a better mountain here in a moment. We're going to talk about a better place here in a moment. But before we get to where they are called to be, converged, before I talk about where we are called to be, I want to, for just a second, talk about where we've come from and where these people that the writer is writing to, where they have come from. I can't preach the whole thing, so a drive-by version of Exodus 3 through Exodus 19, which is where I'm going to read from. It's the part that the writer in Hebrews is drawing from. I want to read that section. So just a super, super 50,000-foot view, Exodus chapter 3, God says to Moses through a burning bush, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses complains because he's concerned about it. He feels like he's not qualified, but ultimately he does it. Pharaoh says no sometimes, which I always think is worth, worth just acknowledging that sometimes when God asks us to do something, don't insert what you think he's going to do after you're obedient. It doesn't always look the way you thought it would look. And sometimes you got to continue to be obedient. Obedient. Obedience is a continual process, not a God said this, so I did it. No, it's God said this, so I did it, and it was hard, so I kept doing it, and I kept being obedient, and I kept being obedient, and I'm trusting God even though it doesn't make sense. That's obedience. And Moses, he continued to be obedient, and finally Pharaoh says, all right, I'm going to let the people go. If you know the story or you saw the movie Prince of Egypt, then all of a sudden the Pharaoh is like, what have I done? I need these Israelites to can help me build this kingdom. So he says, go after them. And so that now the Israelites are panicked, like we're going to die here at the hand of the Egyptian army in the desert. And so if you know the story, again, or you saw the movie, the Red Sea parts, and the, the, the people of Israel walk across on dry ground, and then as the Egyptians are chasing them, of course, the Red Sea comes crashing down on them and kills them, and they are, they are overjoyed. And in fact, you have to know that this Red Sea moment is something that the people of Israel held on to. It was, it was a part of their songs. It was a part of their remembering God's faithfulness. It was a very important part of them remembering where they came from. And then one of the first things that happened is here at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19. I want to read the passage of scripture because this is the way they connect to the very God that saved their lives. The God that was looking out for them. The God that was, that was saying, I'll be your God and you will be my people. This is their relationship with God. Here we go. Verse 9 of Exodus chapter 19. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud, Moses, so the people themselves can hear me speak, hear me when I speak with you. Then they will always trust you. You just kind of stick a pin in that and remember that. Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Verse 10, then the Lord told Moses, go down and prepare the people for my arrival. Consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothing. Be sure they are ready on the third day. For on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai as all the people watch. If you're following along, you don't have to read it out loud, but I am going to ask you to read a couple verses. I'm on verse 12. Right there near the middle where it says mark off. So here, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to ask you to help me with the word here in a moment. Mark off a what? Mark off a boundary all around the mountain. Warn the people. Be careful. Do not go up on the mountain or even touch its what? Anyone who touches the mountain will certainly be put to death. No hand may touch the person or animal that crosses the boundary. If they even touch the person who crossed the boundary, instead stone them or shoot them with arrows. They must be put to death. However, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, then the people may go up on the mountain. This is Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is located on the northeast corner of Egypt, bordering Israel and Gaza which means it's connected to where they came from. It's pretty well attached to the slavery that they just recently came out of. So, Israel, so Sinai kind of reminds them of their slavery. It reminds them of where they've been. And if you know the story, because they're in such close proximity to where they come from, it's not uncommon for them to go, I kind of want to go back. It's connected to where they've come from. Sinai 
is, it's a desert place. So Sinai equals a desert. Sinai equals a mountain of fear. The people and their leader were scared to death. Sinai equals a mountain of fear. And Sinai, as we just read, equals separation from God. God said this, you're not allowed to be where I am. I see you. I take care of you. I will look after you. I will even provide for you. I will be your God and you will be my people, but we cannot have connection. It brings us to this better thing, jumping back to Hebrews chapter 12, that the writer is trying to say, there is an old way to honor God and that is a way of fear and trying and sacrifice. And the writer in Hebrews is saying, we are no longer living at Mount Sinai. Let's read verse 22. No, so he's contrasting. There is a better way. You used to be on that mountain, but not anymore. No, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children whose names are written in heaven. Listen to this. You have come to God himself. I don't miss that. Karen, you can keep that up. I'll just tell you point number one because I want to leave the verse up. Point number one is that the boundaries that are between us and God have been broken. Friend, you, you can have connection with God. Can you imagine? These are people who heard the story. You can't go anywhere near God. Boundaries have been set. You go up the mountain, you're dead. You touch the person that went up the mountain, you're dead too. You do not go where God is. And all of a sudden in Hebrews chapter 12, the writer's trying to say, those days are behind you. God opens his arms. He stretches them wide open and he says, come, be where I am. We can have connection. I am yours and you are mine. It reminds me that earlier in chapter, or earlier in the book of Hebrews in chapter 4, it says this. It won't be on the screen, but I'll read it to you. It says in Hebrews 4, 16, so let us come boldly. Wow, this is crazy. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Can you imagine the contrast? Boundaries You're not allowed or you die. And now the new way of doing things is come in boldly, boldly, not not arrogantly, not cocky, but I belong here. Get get, get this. We went to a wedding last night. That's actually why I'm wearing this suit. It was just still laying out. So I was like, well, that'll work. So I did a wedding yesterday. I married our, our very own Kyle and Juliana. I didn't marry them. They married each other, but I did the ceremony. Um, but, but, but so we, we, when Jess and I went in to find our seat, there was a table that was marked for us. And you could see what table you were sitting at on the screen. And so every all over the screen, people could come in. Maybe they were coming in just passing through the venue. They could see, oh, there's this person knows the, the couple, and they've been, there's a seat been made for them. We knew where we were sitting because our name, somebody had gone ahead of us and, and figured out where we should sit and said, Dustin and Jess had been invited. They belong here. They are friends of ours. And so make sure there's a place at the table when they get here. Friend, in the same way, in the throne room of God, there is a a, a sign up that says your name on it, and there's a seat prepared to you, so you don't come in wondering sheepishly, like, like, am I going to be the last person picked, like, on the dodgeball court and just standing here? No, there is a seat, and it has your name on it, and God says, welcome, child. I'm so glad you're here. We have connection with God. Let's keep reading. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You've come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. Man, it just keeps getting better. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and the people, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. I tell you, the writer of Hebrews and theologians, don't, we don't know exactly who wrote the book. There's some guesses, and they're good guesses, but I'll just say I don't know. So the writer of Hebrews, whoever wrote the book, has such a rich understanding of Old Testament theology, and they're constantly using it to draw back this new covenant. The old covenant was always a part. It's, it's, all, it's the same story of God and his relationship with us. And so all of a sudden, in the middle of this, just like they did Mount Sinai, they referenced the blood of Abel. So this is the second point that I want to make. The sacrifice 
on your behalf, whose name is Jesus, has been accepted. The sacrifice has been accepted. And the reason this is the point is because what's going on here is Abel. There's, there's several ways to interpret this, and they're all really profound. And, and I, we could preach all of them, and I'd feel really good about them. The one I want to kind of draw from today is the reference to Abel speaks to whether or not a sacrifice is accepted. See, Abel died because Cain was upset that his sacrifice wasn't accepted and Abel's was accepted. And so Cain was like, well, that's not cool. I'm jealous of you. So he killed this person. And so the issue at stake is whether or not God accepts the sacrifice and who does he accept it for and why does he accept it for them? And so you and I, can you imagine if we were living under the the, the kind of relationship and and connection to God that says, I'm going to make this and I'm going to wonder if it'll be good enough to put me in right standing. Friend, you never have to wonder about that again because Jesus has come once and for all and the sacrifice that is made on your behalf has been accepted. And this is important. The reason it's important is because the sacrifice is what allows God to accept you because we're sinners and God's a very just God. And so he's got to give us righteousness that makes us good and holy and perfect. And so he took the righteousness of Jesus and he gives it to each and every one of us, the sacrifice has been accepted. And we learn this in the context of Sinai versus Zion. So let's make some, let's make some uh, comparisons here. Sinai equals wilderness journey. Zion equals the promised land. Sinai, where they're just wandering around with no real direction. Sinai is the, Zion is the promised land. Sinai equals desert. Zion, living in Zion, that equals abundance. Sinai reminds them of the slavery. Zion, proves God's deliverance. See, Zion here, is, 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 it's interchangeable with the city of Jerusalem. And Mount Zion was the highest point within that city. So when we're talking about Zion, we're talking about the city Jerusalem, God's city, where, his pre, where, the, where, the, where the temple was. And so this is where God is. And now we now are not called to live at, at Sinai, where just getting near is all of a sudden going to bring down a fire and brimstone. No, no, this is about us being where God is established and going ahead of us to invite us in where he is, giving us a seat at the table. Sinai is a mountain of fear. Zion is a mountain of joy. Did you know these places are roughly 177 miles apart, which is like here to Reading? And they took 40 plus years to get there. So so you got to get this. Like like I I, I know they didn't have cars, and they didn't have cool camper vans like mine. So, so, so they had to walk or, or you know, chariots. And so th- let's just say they walked. I, I Google mapped it to get he- here to Reading's just under six days. It took 40 years, which is why I think the third point is so important. A guide has been given. We no longer have to wander around aimlessly in the desert. Verse 25, we're moving through the text. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. Remember, this is about listening to God. Friend, I just want you to know that there, like, I prayed it when I first got up here. God is so aware of what you're going through. He's not surprised. And just because maybe you haven't talked to him about it doesn't mean that he's in the dark on it. He knows. And there is a guy that's been given to even the most wilderness journeys. Even when we feel like we're just going in circles in life, there is one that we can say, can you come and get me direction? You've made some promises over me, and I just need help getting to the land that was promised for me, we have a guide. Verse 26, when God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that the only, so only the unshakable things will remain. This guide in our life is really passionate about us getting to where he, 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 what he has for us. He's very passionate about shaking the things out of our life that are going to keep us from from getting to the places that he set aside and called us to and that are part of the destiny that he's laid out for us. He's very passionate about it, so much so that the writer here uses the metaphor of an earthquake. Objectively speaking, what is the best way to know just how secure that something is? Shake it up. 
Flip it upside down. You do some like some, some super glue on something and you want to see if it's good, flip it upside down and you'll know if it's going to hold or not. Objectively speaking, the best way to know how secure something is is to, is, is to shake it up, move it around. I know this so well. I, like you, 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 my, my van that I mentioned, I don't know why I talk about my van so much. I, I don't know. I don't know. But, but, but it looks, if you open up the back of it, it looks like the camping section of Amazon threw up. And just like, it's my van. It's just got all that stuff in it. One of the things it has in it is this tall, like seven or eight drawer uh, dresser that was in my daughter's room. She didn't want it anymore. So I put it in my van. It's full of uh, canned food and camping stuff. And I put it in there, meticulously packed it. I was super stoked on it. And I, I, was, I, was, gonna, I was driving wherever I was going to go to next. And I took my first left, because it's on the left side of my van, on this left side uh, cargo van. So just on the back. And I take my first left-hand drawer and all the drawers open up. You know, whoo, and I'm like, oh man, that's not good. But I'm like, I'll get it. And let me just find a place to pull over and I'll get it. Well, before I could find a place to pull over, I took a sharper left hand turn and the entire dresser just fell over. Everything I had meticulously packed is spilled out. The dress, many of the drawers were broken. Why did that happen? Because it was not secure when the shaking started. But here's what I did. I went to Amazon because Amazon is my bestie, and I ordered L brackets, long L brackets. I put two on the back of it, and I put two on the front of it, and it's never moved since. Why is that? Well, because I finally secured it to the foundation. But the problem is that when life shakes us up, you will know what you are secured to. You might be secured to the very thing that God is trying to set loose in your life. You might find that you are connected to the very thing that he wants to go. And so when you are shaken and that thing becomes less confident in your life, you lose your ability to be connected to anything. It's why the songwriter, the hymn writer said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. He is my foundation. And here, here in California, we know a little something about being shaken, right? We know a little something about earthquakes. I didn't know this until I prepared this message, but there is some earthquake safety. So this is a double, I'm just giving you more information that you can take away with you, both for your spiritual journey and for your normal life journey. Earthquake safety. Let me read this to you. Drop, cover, and hold on. It's earthquake safety. Kind of like stop, drop, and roll is for fire. Drop, cover, and hold on. When the shaking starts, drop to the ground, cover your head and neck with your arms, and hold on to a sturdy object until the shaking stops. Drop, cover, and hold on. Because I am super churchy, I realize that I can take those and we can, we can figure out what do we do when our life's being shaken. Okay, uh, this is what pastors do with our spare time. We, we take things and we make sure that they are way over-spiritualized for you. Here we go. First one is drop, but I think this is relevant. When your life begins to shake, when there is a shaking happening in your life, when your sense of foundation is really being rattled, when what you thought was going to last seems as if it might not go the distance, drop. Here's what happens. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Paul says, when I think of all this, that this is all the suffering that he's currently experiencing. He says, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and in earth earth. When I'm not doing okay and my life is being shaken, I drop to my knees because there I find the instruction that I need. What's James say? You want wisdom? Ask for it. And God will be generous to give it to you. Drop. The second one is cover. I mean, these are, these was low hanging fruit for like a, a churchy guy like me. It's Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. Get this, verse 2. We will not fear when earthquakes come, and even if the mountains crumble into the sea. Why? Because God is our refuge and strength. I am covered, what's uh, Psalm 42, I think, say, hiding in the shadow of your wings. We can be covered when hardships come, when, when there's a shaking in our life. Finally, hold on. I like this one. Back to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I have it made, but I am well on my way, reaching out to take hold of Christ, who has so wondrously reached out to take hold of me. There's one who's stretching towards you today saying, you can hold on to me. Will you take hold of his hand in the middle of what you're going through? 
There's, there's hope and help for the, the shaking. Finally, as the band kind of comes and gets ready, we have a prize worth pursuing. Verse 28 of our text, this is where we'll stop. Since we're receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Since we are receiving a kingdom. I, I love the language there, since we are receiving. One of the commentaries I read said this, the ancient grammar and phrasing indicates that we are constantly and perpetually receiving a kingdom that is completely incapable of being shaken. We are constantly, if we allow ourselves, position ourselves to receive the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, you scared me to death. <laughs> that Red Bull, no more Red Bull for Steve. If anybody ever gives Steve another Red Bull, we are constantly lost his wings. <laughs> we are constantly being, we have the ability to receive the kingdom of God. It's why Jesus prayed. If you remember the prayer, he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can receive what, what, is, what is set aside for us one day face to face with Jesus. He wants to constantly and perpetually give us what we need. Friend, one, one day the shaking will be over. The pain will be no more. The tears will cease. What's been broken will be made new. But can I tell you something? And maybe, maybe this will be a helpful reminder for someone. Until then, we have an enemy whose only job. We have an enemy whose name is Satan, and he's very real. And he hates you, and he hates your family, and he hates God's design for your life. His only play is to try to shake us loose from being firmly planted in Jesus Christ. His only play is to try to distract us, to divide the things in our life, discourage us, derail us. And so I just want to ask you today to just be mindful. Where are you planted? Because here's the interesting thing. Maybe you're like me and you, you look at the people in Hebrews and you're like, man, if I could have seen God like that, like the mountains and the, and the billowing smoke and the voice from heaven, like Moses is asking a question and God's like, Yes, Moses, I, you know, he's like talking back and the people are like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. And then, I, I mean, it was, can you imagine what a terrible and wonderful and just cosmic sized sight that that is? Maybe you're like me. You're like, if that ever happened to me, I would never sin again. I, I would be set. I, you know, I just wanted to tell you that that's really not the way that it goes. You're never scared into holiness. You are loved into holiness, into a deeper relationship with Jesus because this is what the, People in Israel did in Exodus chapter 32, just a few chapters later in, in verse 1. This is the same people that just experienced all that that we read. And Moses went back to God to get additional words from him for the people themselves. And this is the people's response just a few chapters later. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here in, from the land of Egypt. Completely abandoned and forgotten. You know, friend, shaking, boredom, your plans versus God's plans, they are at war to shake you loose from what God is trying to do in, in you and your family and your giftings and your wiring. So what does this mean for you? And what does this mean for us? What does it mean for you? Well, will you believe and receive Jesus today? See, Sinai is all about earning and deserving. Zion is all about believing and receiving. At, at Sinai, man, you better hope the sacrifice is accepted. And some of you perhaps are, are, are never, even, never even gave Jesus a thought. Will you believe and receive Jesus today? Others of you have just been camped at Mount Sinai, still in that religious earn and deserve way of thinking. Friend, can I just tell you, man, pack that camp up and move to Zion where what will happen is you will serve Jesus out of the overflow and abundance of how good and faithful that he is and how much he loves you. And you'll live your life with a grat grateful expression of, of Jesus. I just want to give you my life because you're so good. You're so faithful. You, you, you've been so, you've, you've walked with me through everything. Rather than, I hope, we, you know, it's like a, this cosmic daisy plucking. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. Friend, he loves you. The daisy in heaven is he loves he loves me, 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 he loves me. Well, that maybe that's what it means for you is today the day. 
You move from Sinai to Jerusalem. And maybe today's a day where you say, I want to walk with Jesus. I want to know Jesus. What does this mean for us? Well, in those, in those four points, Converge, we have to be a place without boundaries and borders to get to Jesus. I want to say it again, and I'll say it with a little more passion, but when I finish that sentence, I hope any of y'all that are with me in that will give me a resounding amen. Converge, we have to be a place without boundaries and borders that keep people from getting to Jesus. Man, that's the cry of my heart. The church, if we're not careful, we have a way of being gatekeepers and boundary setters, that if you figure this out or if you clean that up or if you change this, then we'd love to have you. Or worse, this is, I think, worse because it's destructive and it's manipulative. Come as you are. But in a year, if you're not more like us, you better go. And we don't want to be that place. We want people to know that, that, that your journey with Jesus is something we, we want to just run with you. And we're here to walk with you and to help you discover more of who he is. Converge, we have to be a place without boundaries and borders for people to get to Jesus. The second thing was that we have the best news of all time. That the sacrifice to Jesus has been accepted. And it's been accepted for every single address in Sacramento and Elk Grove and Rancho Cordova and, and Wilton. And I mean, every single heartbeat living in this city, I want them to know what, what Jesus has done for them. You know, the thing I've said multiple times, a missionary said, knowing he would likely die in this cannibalist country, and he's on a boat, and if you remember the story, I was told he cries out, may the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering, knowing he would die, pushes off, his family weeping, knowing that they'll probably never see him again. And he says, may the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And he said it over and over and over again as he went. I want the lamb who was slain to receive the reward of his suffering through me and through us. Amen. Thirdly, we have a God and for even the most turned around people. Oh, man, to tell the person in our cubicle next to us, to tell the person who's our neighbor, to tell our family member, our cousin, our kid. Hey, you, you, I'm not here to... I'm not here to make you feel bad for the decisions that you make. I'm here to introduce you to Jesus who has a way of making sense out of senselessness. He has a way of reviving even the most dead places. He restores even the most broken places. When there's hopelessness, he gives hope. We, we have that news, and we've got to make sure that every single person knows we have a guide that wants to meet them in their journey right where they are. And then number four, we just got to keep going because we have a prize worth pursuing. There is something better in store and it is so tempting to be diagnosed with Esau syndrome you know like trading the right now and, and what we want for our, our identity and our destiny to who God has called us to be so we, we, we've got to keep going so as we turn the page to a new place May it represent just a gigantic step in us saying, God, we are continuing to go. We are relentlessly pursuing this thing you've called us to. And can I tell you something? I know I'm short on time, and, and, and I, I'm over time, but I'm going to tell you anyways. This was such an encouraging thing. So I did, I did that concert just mentioned, and here's, here's what I know. What I know is on that stage at Golden Sky Festival, the main stage, like there, you know, it was all the artists that were there shared this stage. And on our stage, on our set, I said, yeah, most of these guys are like full-time musicians and rock stars. I'm a pastor. So I passed, there's a few people from Converge that were there. So I heard, I heard, woo, and I was like, oh, that's people from my church. And, and I said, I, you know, I, we, I wrote a song. It's called, I Thank God. It's kind of my story. It's a country song. It's, it's really about how grateful that I am. I tend to fight my heritage a little bit because I'm an angsty person person by nature. I tend to fight my heritage a little bit, but I decided to write a song, how grateful that I am that my dad, my dad's dad and his daddy and his daddy were just, they loved God and they did their best to serve him. And so I inherited a legacy. And so I'm thankful for that story. And I'm still trying to anchor everything about my life to the person of Jesus. And I'm, I'm untangling some of the difficult things that I've experienced. So I said, I want to, I, I just want you to know this is a song about how grateful I am to experience the grace of God. In the middle of that song at Golden Sky Festival, we sang Amazing Grace. And here's what's crazy. So as I'm walking through, and it was very kind. People are very, they are very thoughtful. Can I get a picture? Will you sign this? And 85% of the people that said, can I get a picture, said, hey, man, thanks for sharing that thing about the church. I wanted them to say, you're a great songwriter. Or like, man, you were definitely the best guitar player on stage. 
But what most people said is, thank you for saying what you said about the church. Do you know what I learned? People aren't as angsty towards the church as we've made them out to be. If we just go show them the goodness of Jesus, that's what the world needs and is longing for. And so God has created this place to close the gap that those who are on the outside, that people like us might meet them where they are and just show them, this is my story. We say it often, every story matters here. And when we just say, this is how good Jesus is to me. You know what's crazy when I'm learning? People are pretty open to that conversation. What they're not open to is you should and how dare you and change this and stop this. No one wants to hear that, but the, the gap is closing. I left Golden Sky with a sense of like, God, you is our church. And the individual things that we do to continue to close that gap because people are ready to hear it. They're open to hear it. So may we go to this new place aware that we've been called to stand in that gap and to close that gap. And I believe he's going to use us to do incredible things in this city. I I believe that if I didn't believe this, I'd, I'd find something different to do. I believe that because of our church, There'll be people that didn't know how good and faithful Jesus was. And we will share the glory and the renown of Jesus. And people will come to know what they didn't know. And that is that they belong in the family of God with us. Too many open seats in here. I want to fill them up with people in this city who don't know that we'll know because we told them. You can clap. That's good news. Or don't clap. That was awkward. (laughs) God, I pray for every person here. There's going to be some people that even right now I need to say I believe in I receive Jesus and so I pray that they would even now as I'm praying this prayer that they would settle into the idea that it's as simple as like thank you Jesus for what you've done and that begins the journey of believing and receiving Jesus and for that person that might do that today may you give them the encourage or give them the courage and the strength to find me or Ed or anyone that they've seen on this stage today or start with the person next to them and say I'd like to know more about about living for Jesus. For that person, God, that's got their 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 stakes are deep, deeply rooted in Sinai, and and you are trying to pull them towards Zion. Because in Sinai, there's there's no connection. You're not family members. But in Zion you belong. There's, there's, there's a name plate at the table for, for every single person in this room. So there are some people who are exhausted from doing the religious thing. I pray you'd give them the courage to, to metaphorically rip up that tent and to replant themselves and their family in a place where abundance and, and freedom it, it can, can be their neighbor. And so, God, I pray that as we move forward as the church and we head to Valley High School, I pray that that neighborhood has no idea what's in store for them. They, like, God, I, I, I pray Converge would be like a deep drink of water for every single house within a 10-block radius. All of a sudden now, they just know that there are, there are people here that care about me, that really want to, to do life with me, and that that would start there, and then you would show us and lead us and guide us, and how in the world do we then ripple that through the whole city? I know how you're going to do it. You're going to do it through each and every one of us who will leave that place and then they'll go to where they reside. And may then they, those that that love Converge and that that feel called to this mission, may when they get home, they would be the kind of kind of Christ follower in their neighborhood that would show that neighborhood how much they are loved and cared for it. And, and, and I pray that that would ripple 10 block radius. And before you know it, we're all just kind of showing this city by being a missional church to every single neighborhood and street in this city. That's what we pray for. I know it sounds lofty, but the good news is you said you'd give us everything we, we, we ask for and the things we can't even think to ask. So I pray you'd blow our minds the kind of thing you want to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Will somebody say amen? Amen. I know we're a little bit over, but we're going to stand up together and sing a song that says, this is who we were and this is who we are becoming. It's called My Testimony.